it's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ewan Pearson, who is, I suspect, well known to many of you. Ewan is a professor of diabetic medicine at the University of Dundee. He's a visiting professor at the University of Edinburgh and a guest professor at the University of Lund. So he certainly has a taste for lovely parts of the world to go and become either um, visiting uh, guest or de facto professors. Of course, Ewan has uh, many skills, particularly in the field of, of, of diabetes, where he is a recognised global expert, recognised numerous awards, um, highlighting, for example, the Minkowski Award recently, and is, is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. His research, which I think will become rather obvious to you, has focused on looking at phenotypic and genotypic determinants of particularly drug uh, response in diabetes. And I, I would refer you, for example, to Godart's and MyResource, which is something that he and his colleagues have really made huge advances in the field with. So Ewan, without further ado, it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Ian. So I'm going to talk around implementing precision diabetes care. And in recent years in type 2 diabetes, we have the very fortunate position that we have many drugs that we can use. Um, so we've got seven drugs, and this is one of the recent guidelines from the ADA and the ASD. And the challenge, of course, with having so many drugs is really knowing when to use which drug. Um, there is now evidence that if people have got high risk for cardiovascular disease or renal disease, then they fall into this block on the left of the screen, um, which um, will guide people to using SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. But most people actually fall in this side, so they don't have that increased risk. And that means we're left with this choice of six drugs um, and how do we choose which to give. So we know from randomised controlled trials, of course, that these look at the average effect. And we know on average that GLP-1 receptor agonists, for example, are potent weight losing drugs with cardiovascular benefit, but they're expensive. But what we want to know when we're treating our patients is what's, how is the patient in front of us going to respond to that drug? So we might consider their ethnic origin, their phenotype, simple things like BMI and renal function, more complex pathophysiology, their genotype, their metabolome, their microbiome. So you can see how we could factor all of these individual factors in to better inform on our decision making around outcome and side effects. And that's really precision treatment. So what I want to do um, in the next uh, 14 minutes um, is really think around how we can optimise treatment in type 2 diabetes. I want to talk around heterogeneity in type 2 diabetes and then how we can predict response, uh, move beyond glucose to cardiometabolic disease and then how we are implementing precision diabetes care in Tayside. So heterogeneity of type 2 diabetes, what I love about the treatment of type 2 diabetes is that every patient that comes through the door is different. Um, and that's largely because it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We rule out type 1 diabetes and pretty much everyone left has got type 2 diabetes. And yet, etiologically, they're very different. Um, and yet, we treat them all the same. So there have been a number of ways to try and tease out these differences in, in etiology. And one of the ways that got a lot of press and continues to get much discussion was applying a clustering approach, a k-means clustering approach, to a population data set from Sweden. And this identified five subtypes of diabetes, a group with type 1 diabetes, which is this grey group here with autoimmune diabetes, but then splitting type 2 diabetes into four discrete subtypes. Now, intuitively, that sounds very attractive. We can say that there isn't just type 2 diabetes, there's type 2A, type 2B, type 2C. But actually, the problem with this approach is it forces people into discrete clusters. It's a hard clustering approach. And actually, when you start to look into more detail into this, which we've done, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, massive amount of overlap between these clusters that makes it clinically not so helpful. What we've done, and this uses the data that, that we've, we have available to us in Scotland, um, is we've looked at the Tayside and Fife population of people with diabetes. And when you go back through their medical records and identify them at diagnosis, and this is 23,000 people at diagnosis. And we look at simple clinical measures, blood pressure, HbA1c, BMI, ALT, triglycerides. And then we apply a nonlinear dimensionality reduction approach. So this is a bit like, well, it's a nonlinear principal components analysis, essentially. So you end up with this tree structure. And every dot in this tree is a person. 
And so what you can see when you overlay the phenotypes is that somebody up at the top left of this tree has got a particularly high HDL. Someone down at the bottom right has got high triglycerides. The top right is particularly characterized by people with high blood pressure. But what we've done here deliberately is keep this as a continuum. We haven't tried to cluster and say that there are distinct subtypes. We try not to start talking about different arms of the tree. We just accept there's a continuum of spread. But what you can now do is ask the question around, well, does it matter where you are in the tree? Um, so you can then overlay what is the risk of progression to insulin or what is the risk of complications of diabetes? So you can see the people down at the bottom right are more likely to progress to insulin. But at the top right, they're much more likely to get retinopathy, both background and referable retinopathy, with cardiovascular disease and CKD again worse at the bottom. We validated this in UK Biobank. We take the UK Biobank population with type 2 diabetes, map them to the same Scottish tree, and again show the same axes in terms of, of um, progression to, to insulin and to cardiovascular disease. But interestingly, when we then look at the ADOPT study, and this is a trial um, of monotherapy of metformin, sulfonylureas, and thiazolidine dienes. What we've done here is map the trial participants to the Scottish population. Firstly, you can see lots of gray area, and this is people who aren't represented in the clinical trials. So this is a really nice visualization of how RCTs are not represented of the real world. But what you can also see is that the people down at the bottom right fail quicker with metformin and with sulfonylureas but for TZDs, for thiazolidine dienes, that axis is quite different. It's people down at the left here that fail quicker. So where you are in the tree determines how you respond to drug treatment. And we've created this into um, an app and there's a QR code. If you're quick enough to scan it, you can go and play on the app and you could then incorporate all of the clinical characteristics of this individual. And this is someone I've deliberately taken to be an extreme individual in terms of phenotype. He sits down here on the tree, one of the most adverse people I could come up with. Um, and for him, he's only 40. His risk of going on to insulin in the next five years is about 40 percent. And actually, even though he's only 40, he's got a 10 percent risk of of cardiovascular events. Whereas this chap is slimmer. He's obviously older, um, but his lipid profile and his HbA1c and his ALT puts him up here in the tree. And you can see here, this is a much better place to be. He's got much lower rates of progression to insulin. Um, but of course, because of his age, he's still at quite high risk of cardiovascular disease. So hopefully you can see there how we need to recognize heterogeneity in the phenotype of type 2 diabetes, and that really predicts outcome. So let's move on to think around, can we actually predict response to therapy? And this is work that John Dennis from Exeter has really led on as part of a consortium called the, the Mastermind Consortium, which was an MRC funded precision medicine consortium. And over the, the years, we have published a number of papers identifying clinical parameters that predict response or side effect to different drugs. And I'm not going to go into those here. But the most important thing to recognize here is that it's all very well saying that BMI might be associated with response to a drug. What we really need to know is that BMI is associated with a response, a good response to a drug A and a poor response to drug B. So we, we need to be looking for differential response if we're to choose on treatment based upon clinical parameters. So that's what we show. And this is work that John did in CPRD, the primary care data set um, from, from across the UK. Um, and what we're looking at here is change in HbA1c, so that below the line people respond better. Um, and what we're looking at here is BMI. So if you have a higher BMI, you respond better if you're below the line. And if you have a higher BMI, you will respond worse if you're above the line. And we look at four different drugs. And you can see that DPP4s and SUs respond differently to TZDs in relation to BMI. There's a differential response. So if your BMI is over 30, you have a greater glucose lowering with TZDs. If your BMI is under 30, you have greater glucose lowering with DPP4s. We see something similar for EGFR. So if you have a higher EGFR, you respond better to SGLT2 inhibitors than you do um, if the, to DPP4 inhibitors, TZDs and SUs. So again, here we've, we've chosen the example of the DPP4s. If your EGFR is greater than 90, you respond better to SGLT2 inhibitors. If your EGFR is 60 to 90, so this is still what we would consider to be um, reasonable renal function, not, not chronic kidney disease, then you respond better to DPP-4 inhibitors. 
that was from observational data and people would always argue that you can't just infer uh, you can't just take forward observational data you need to do a trial um, so we have done a trial called the trimaster trial um, and this is not published yet um, but this was a trial that we specifically set up for precision medicine so it wasn't a parallel arm randomized controlled trial where you just don't have the power to look at these subgroup effects in the crossover design, we, we give people four months of pioglitazone, citagliptin, and canagliflozin in a random order. We look to see how people respond, and we ask patients which drugs they liked. And I think key here, and I won't go into this data, but it's fascinating around how people choose which drug they prefer. So this allows us then to ask some of those questions we just raised. So does BMI matter for response to TZDs and citagliptin? So if your BMI is under 30, you do respond better in the trial to citagliptin. And if it's over 30, you respond better to pioglitazone. And the difference here is three millimoles per mole. That's not a huge difference, um, but we know this for zero cost because we all know BMI and it's available in all the records. This is renal function. Um, again, showing if your EGFR is 60 to 90, you respond better to citagliptin and canagliflozin. And again, the difference is about three millimoles per mole. So really confirming that your phenotype predicts your likelihood of responding. And we've just got a paper published in Lancet Digital Health um, where we have also um, developed an app that you can use that will allow you to put in clinical data and see which is the best drug of these two drugs. And this is um, SGLT2s and, and DPP4 inhibitors. And we are developing um, a model that will include all five second line drugs. So moving on, that was all around glucose, a glucose centric view of diabetes. And of course, diabetes is, is a cardiometabolic disease. We know now, and this was essentially the big box in, in that algorithm off to the left, that people with heart failure should get SGLT2 inhibitors, people with coronary artery disease should either get SGLT2 inhibitors or, or GLP-1 receptor agonists, people with chronic kidney disease should get SGLT2 inhibitors, and there's good evidence that pioglitazone or semaglutide can reduce liver fat if not fibrosis. And of course, we've got biomarkers that we can now use as well that tell us whether someone is at risk, even pre-symptomatically. BMP troponin, polygenic risk scores, particularly for coronary artery disease, and, and fibrosis markers. So these aren't genetic, but these are simple tests that we can do that would identify people at risk. Briefly, just to talk around polygenic risk scores and coronary artery disease, this is a, a, a nice example, I think, of how we can use polygenic risk scores clinically. So this is taking a group of people, um, men aged 40 to 54, and it's looking at their instance of coronary artery disease. The red line is the people who have a high clinical risk score um, and a high polygenic risk score. So as you'd expect, they've got high risk. Similarly, the green line, a low clinical risk, low polygenic risk score. The purple line are essentially a low clinical risk score, but a high polygenic risk score. So they've been uplifted in terms of their risk on the basis of their polygenic risk score. And the blue line have got a high clinical risk, but they um, low polygenic risk score, and they've been down regulated or down shifted in terms of their risk. And when we look in the in the local population at polygenic risk and look at the people with a, a coronary artery disease risk below 20% who might not get GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors, the group who have the high genetic risk score, their, their risk is uplifted from 7% to 14% by virtue of taking into account their genetic risk score. So how can we bring all of this together? We're very fortunate that the Chief Scientist Office um, came up with a funding scheme called the Precision Medicine Alliance Scotland, and we received funding for this. And what was so good about this funding is it forced us to think about implementation. So what we have developed is the Intelligent Diabetes Platform, or iDiabetes, um, which is using enhanced phenotyping of patients for precision diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So on the left, what we can see is we're essentially trying to tease apart the complex etiologies of diabetes and the multimorbidities to, by use of, of genetics and non-genetic biomarkers and simple clinical measures to, um, to provide a, a more precise treatment plan. Critically, we, we have an amazing informatic system for diabetes in Scotland. I would say world leading. We have everybody with diabetes in Sky Diabetes. We have all of their data and we don't really use the data to inform on our treatment decisions. 
Patients also have access to their data in, my, in the My Diabetes My Way portal. And we also have a spin out company from Dundee called My Way Digital Health that's already developed quite a lot of prediction models and dashboards. So our plan is that we are going to implement a precision diabetes approach across the entire population of Tayside in a cluster randomized design. So we will randomize 10,000 people to enhanced eye diabetes care and leave the rest having standard of care. And this will then inform the annual review and the decisions um, that, that, are, that are being fed back to the clinicians. Because it's randomized, we can of course evaluate whether it's effective and cost effective. And we will have a huge amount of data that will continue to inform on diabetes care and outcomes as part of this learning healthcare system. So in my last slide, this is what it looks like. I won't go into this in detail, but we are essentially doing GUAS and polygenic risk scores. We're measuring beta cell function and insulin sensitivity. We're doing BMPs and troponins and liver fibrosis markers in this population of 10,000 people. That will allow us to better diagnose type 1 diabetes and monogenic diabetes, to think around the phenotypic variation in type 2 diabetes, to come up with prediction based upon John Dennis's models of prediction, identify people at risk of hypoglycemia, and then critically use things like the BMP and troponins to guide people through to the drugs that we know are amazing for heart failure and for coronary artery disease, so the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and some targeted treatment for liver um, fibrosis. Um, and we will obviously then evaluate how that works. So this has just started in July. We go live in May and hopefully in a few years time, we'll have some results. I shall finish there just by acknowledging my team, the funders and the iDiabetes team. Thank you very much.